chapter 2. Man, I wanted to... I wanted to come back to this text. Uh, This is one of the texts that we have talked about a lot uh, throughout the 20-year history of our congregation. In fact, it's it's one of the the earliest texts that I preached from when we were first starting uh, back in 2003. It's 2023 now, Um, 2003, and it's so good to be with you as we mark this incredibly momentous milestone in the history of our church It started 20 years ago. Um, I realize most of you weren't there 20 years ago when we got started. Uh, A few of you were, but most of you weren't. And you got here just as soon as you could, right? Amen? Uh, Even for those of you that have just come today, maybe for the first time, we're glad you're here and glad you got to join us uh, as we celebrate this. But for those who were here in those early years or those early days... Uh, You're going to know what I'm about to tell you is true because I think you will uh, remember those early days along with me. It was not expected that our church was going to survive when we first started. Um, There hadn't been, to to my knowledge, a a new church plant in our county for uh, a number of decades that had survived. Uh, Many had tried, but but not survived. On top of that, we we were meeting in an unair-conditioned barn And uh, in all of our church planting wisdom, we decided to start in May with summer upon us uh, in South Texas. Why we did that, I still have no idea. I guess none of us remembered that it gets to be like 180 uh, here, and air conditioning is a nice thing. But uh, many people didn't think we would would last through the summer, that people would continue to come. And uh, it was there in the most amazing unlikely and unforgettable ways that God just began to manifest himself among us. People started getting saved and baptized, and and God's blessings have continued uh, for 20 years. We we didn't have much. Uh, We didn't have anything, really. Um, We didn't have a building to call our own. We didn't have offices. Um, We didn't even have a staff. We didn't have money. (laughs) We, 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 uh, didn't have much of anything. I mean, I was, I was then single and uh, living in my grandmother's spare bedroom. Um, you guys were paying me $100 a week when we first got started because we didn't have much more than that. And um, I was grateful for it, and you were probably overpaying me for what you got uh, in that, that 22-year-old uh, preacher back then. Gerald will amen that, I know uh, for sure. <laughs> But I, I say you had no staff because um, I, I was working a full-time job during the week and just devoting a few hours on, in the evenings and then on the weekends uh, to the church as we got started. We didn't have a website. We didn't have social media. Uh, we didn't have any missionaries on our missions wall. We didn't have any church plants. We were the church plant. We didn't even have computers. We couldn't afford them. We, we didn't even have, I was thinking about this, this last week, we didn't even have a trailer to haul our sound equipment and gear back and forth in. We, we couldn't afford one in the early days. And had it not been for the generosity of, of David and Brianna Fay, who loaned us their trailer so we could haul things back and forth, and they were so generous and allowed us to store it in their barn during the week and Uh, made provisions when they needed to use it. They would unpack it all and repack it all and bring it back and forth. And and we have stories after stories after stories of people that were on our leadership team and in our core team that made great sacrifices like that to help fill those gaps for all the stuff we didn't have. There's a really, really long list of things we did not have. I could go on and on and on about all the stuff we didn't have. But you know, it's not really about what you don't have. It's about what you do have. And, and as I was thinking about it, um, it's what we did have that God used. And we didn't have much, but God took, took what we did have and he used it. And he didn't just use it in the early days, in the early years. He's been using the same things that we had in those early days for the last 20 years. And there's only two things. We only had two things when we first started. We had a calling and a mission, and we had the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all we had. We have a lot more today. 
Just look around. We, we just broke ground on a new $4 million building project that's debt-free that you've raised the money for. What a testimony of God's love and his grace and his power. We do have a website. We do have social media and people watching us live. We do have missionaries all over the world and ministries impacting our local community on a weekly and even daily basis. We, we do have a, a little bit of money now to go and do things with. We do have a building and we do have a C. Amen, right? Uh, we, we have a lot more today than we have well, than we had then. But I can promise you this. If we lose our calling and our mission, or if we lose sight of the centrality and the gravity of the gospel, it will not matter what we have, because it will fail us, and it will prove to be worthless. Those things that we have are nice to have, they're wonderful to have, they're amazing tools that we have got to steward and steward well for the Lord and his kingdom. But today I want to bring us back to the beginning and remind you that it's really just a calling and a mission and the gospel that is needed to reach the world, our county and our community for Jesus. Acts chapter 2, this is where we began some 20 years ago. Verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together, and they held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property, and they distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day... They devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This young church here in Acts chapter 2 didn't have very much, did they? They didn't have a building, they didn't have money, they didn't have a website, they didn't have social media, they didn't have a manual for how to start a church, they didn't have a church starting strategist, but they had a calling and a mission, and they had the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what God used, just as he did in our midst when we didn't have anything. This was a church here in Acts 2 that took radical risks, and they saw miraculous manifestations of God's grace. And it produced fabulous, amazing, unbelievable amounts of fruit for the Lord in a very short amount of time. And I think from this text, we can learn four things as we consider the gravity and the importance of the gospel here in our day and age, here in our history as a church. The big idea for today is this, it all starts and ends with the gospel. It all starts and ends with the gospel. We see it in Acts, and we've seen it here in our own church life as well. For this church in Acts and for us, there must be a very firm and uncompromising commitment to the gospel of Jesus and the calling God has put on us. There are four things we see here. First, we see their identification with the gospel. It's not just a a general identification, it's a personal identification with the gospel. The people, not the pastor, not the leaders, not the lay pastors, not the elders, the people, the church, the congregation, the, the called out ones had a personal identification with the gospel. They didn't have all the things you would think a church plant would need, but they had a personal identification with the gospel. They didn't have a super children's and youth pastor. They didn't have a great building to meet in. They didn't have safety or security or protection from their government. They didn't have an awesome sound system and video system. They didn't have awesome people that know how to run all the technology to make all of that work, but they had a calling and they had the gospel. Honestly, they really didn't have much of any of the things that you would think today are needed to start a church. 
But they had everything they needed to start a church. They had a calling and they had the gospel. And they had a bunch of people who personally identified themselves with the gospel. Look at verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They accepted his message. They personally identified with the message of the gospel. They confessed Christ as their Lord and Savior. But they did not stop there. They personally and publicly and powerfully, by the way, identified with the gospel by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's remember this church in Acts chapter 2 lived in a much different world than you and I live. They lived in a pre-Christian culture, a pre-Christian world. And these people coming forward, thousands upon thousands of them coming forward to be baptized are taking a radical risk that can cost them their lives. Because they are publicly identifying with the gospel. Their public baptism was for all to see. 3,000 of them did it. I bet it made the newspaper. I bet people were talking about this. If there would have been bloggers and social media, it would have been everywhere. This would have been amazing news. Their personal identification with the gospel. They didn't just say yes to Jesus in secret and hold it there. No, they went out and they were publicly identified with the gospel through their baptism. That's what baptism is. It's a public identification with the gospel. It's a great sign and symbol. It's something we're all supposed to do. But part of what it is, is it's saying I personally and publicly identify with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for these, it was a radical risk, much riskier than it is for you and I today in America. For them, it was a declaration that could lead to their very death. But they were baptized. It does not say some of them were baptized. It says they were all baptized. You want to know why? Because that's what you're supposed to do when you identify with the gospel. Baptism has never been an option for believers. It's not something you need to even pray about or think about. You're supposed to repent and then be baptized. That's how it's supposed to work. It goes hand in hand with your salvation, with your confession of Christ. It's supposed to be a public profession and a personal identification with the gospel. What was it that Peter said to them in Acts chapter 2? Verses 37 and 38. He said, when they heard this, they came under deep conviction and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? Some translations say, what must we do to be saved? And the response comes immediately from Peter. He says, repent and be baptized, each of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, each of you. And they did. They made that personal identification with the gospel, with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. They made a powerful and public proclamation about their eternal transformation through the gospel. There can be no mistake about it. If we expect God's blessing to remain on us, we must identify ourselves with the gospel and the cross of Jesus. We must not be ashamed of it. We cannot be scared to mention it or to talk about it. We must personally identify with it. Again, not your leaders. I mean, they need to do it too, but all of us. Church, can I tell you, we do not need to identify with our culture to reach the culture with the gospel. We do not need to identify with one political party or another to reach people with the gospel. We do not need to identify with the mass amount of movements that men are creating 
to attempt to achieve their own ends or to accomplish their own purposes to identify with and reach people with the gospel. No, sir. We have been called out of darkness into light. We have been rescued from the pit. We have been transformed into a holy priesthood. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Therefore, we identify first and only with Jesus Christ and his gospel. That identification, in most cases, will start with baptism for you. But it does not end there. We must always make it our aim to identify with the gospel every day of our lives for the rest of our lives. If this is who we are, then it is what we are. If this is who you are, then it is who God has created you to be. And if we become a church that ever identifies with something else, I can promise you, We will lose what we have seen God do over the last 20 years. Because I'm telling you, it all starts and ends with the gospel. Number two, we see a great devotion to the gospel. It's more than just a personal identification with the gospel. They were devoted to it. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This word devotion appears again in verse 46. They were devoted to the teachings of the apostles, to fellowshipping, to gathering together, to breaking bread, to being in small groups, to praying together and praying for each other. But all of these things spring from a believer's devotion to the gospel. If you're really devoted to the gospel, you want to learn, you want to be in church, you want to study God's word with other believers, you want to gather together with the body of Christ if you're devoted to the gospel. If you're devoted to the gospel, you want to meet with others who are devoted to the gospel in small groups and large. If you're devoted to the gospel, you want to pray. If you're devoted to the gospel, you have a passion for the things of the gospel, a passion for reading God's word. If you're devoted to the gospel, then you're excited by the gospel. You're energized by the gospel. You're enthusiastic about the gospel. You're encouraged by the gospel. So your devotion then to the gospel becomes this very real, very raw, and very radical thing to other peoples who do not know the truth of the gospel. You see, all of our devotion finds its power when Jesus and the good news of his gospel is at the center of our lives and devotion to him. If you look at the things that matter the most to you right now, the things you are devoted the most to right now, where do Christ and the good news of his gospel fall on that list of things? Where do God and his church land on your list? Where do Jesus and his kingdom fall when you consider all the things you're devoted to right now? Church, I will promise you right now, if we lose our devotion to Christ and the gospel, we will never again see what we have seen over the last 20 years. All that we have seen God do has been because we have personally identified with and we have been completely devoted to Jesus and the gospel. And our devotion to the gospel compels us then to be devoted to scripture, to be devoted to each other, to be devoted to prayer, to be devoted to missions, to be devoted to planting churches, to be devoted to ministry, to be devoted to being people above reproach, people of character and integrity. It all springs from our devotion to the gospel. We don't do those things for the sake of those things. We do them for the sake of the gospel and the testimony God has given us. Therefore, we must identify with the gospel and be devoted to the gospel. It all starts and ends with the gospel. Look with me now to verse 44. This is important. It's point number three, and that is unity. 
through the gospel. Look at what it says. Let's back up to verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs are being performed through the apostles. Now look at verse 44. Now all the believers were together, and they held all things in common. Other translations capture it other ways. I love the way one particular translation says it. It says, and all believers, all the believers, lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. Now, this doesn't mean they all lived together. It doesn't doesn't mean they all sold their houses and built a compound and moved in. We would call that a cult. That's not what this is. Rather, it means they were together in unity. They were together in purpose, in their calling, in their mission, in their identification with and devotion to the gospel. They were together in spirit. It doesn't mean they all got along all the time. It doesn't mean they never had a fight or a disagreement. It it doesn't mean one opinion had to win out over another opinion at times. It doesn't mean that. It just means at the end of the day, they were devoted to the kingdom of God and to the gospel. And they were able to put their, their flesh aside and their differences aside and even their personal preferences and opinions aside for the sake of the gospel. They were together in their mission. They were together in their motivation. They were unified by their objective and their calling. Can I just tell you there's only one thing that I know of that has the power to, in this case here in Acts, bring 3,000 people together in unity? That is the gospel of Jesus. It is the good news of Christ. They found their unity through the gospel. Church mission statements are great, but mission statements will not produce unity over 20 years. A building program, I can promise you, does not produce unity. (laughs) Just the opposite in most cases. A great preacher cannot produce unity. He doesn't possess the power or the ability. Bylaws are great. They're needed. Churches have to have some governing documents. I I get why they're there. But can I tell you, they are not the answer to unity. True unity for believers is found only through the gospel. When the gospel of Jesus is at the center of the church, then and only then will you find real unity. Look at how Paul puts it in his letter to the Colossians, Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, I love how he reminds them of who they are and how God has called them and what they are supposed to be like. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, that's for you today, church. He says, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. He says, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were called, the gospel, to which you were called in one body, rule your hearts. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice what he says. He binds this idea of unity, this concept of unity with the gospel. We're called to forgive as the Lord forgave us. That's the gospel. We're called to love as the Lord loved us. We're called to be compassionate and kind and humble and gentle and patient in these verses. Just as the Lord was with all of us. All of that, the sum of all of that is the good news of the gospel. He says, remember to how you were called and to what you were called. Remember that you've been transformed. And now it's your job to go out in unity and do these things together. The center of it all is the gospel. We could look at many more passages of scripture, but here's the reality. Here's the reality. 
God expects his church to be united in one spirit for one purpose and under one gospel. Because it all starts and ends with the gospel. The devil has attempted many times to destroy our unity over the last 20 years. And, and I mean, I, I, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. I kind of look at it as good news, but some of y'all may look at it as bad news. I don't think he's going to give up anytime soon. This church is making too big of an impact, too big of a dent. It's producing too many disciples. It's sending the gospel into dark, deserted, desolate places that other churches will dare not go. And so I suspect, in fact, I am certain the devil is not going to give up in the next 20 years if we continue to be devoted to the gospel. So I'm telling you today, we have to be on guard. We have to watch. And we have to, no matter what, remain united through the gospel. Remain in unity through the gospel. Because he will, our enemy will continue to try to destroy us. I have no doubt of it. There's one final thing we see, and we'll close with this. It's generosity for the gospel. God has always called his people to be radically generous people. He's always called from the Old Testament all the way through the New. He's called his people, his called out ones, to be people of radical generosity. That did not change with the arrival of Jesus or the proclamation of the, of the gospel, as some would like to tell you. In fact, there's nothing at all in all of life, in all of the world, in all of the history of the universe, more generous than the gospel. Think about the generosity of God and the generosity of Jesus through the gospel. That God would send his one and only begotten son, the perfect lamb of God, to a lost, lonely, fallen, forsaken, wretched world to rescue sinners who willfully and willingly disobey him over and over and over again. And then that God would put his son on the cross and he would crush him there with all of the combined sum of the wickedness and depravity of the entire world as it would fall upon him who was our sacrifice. So that we might be saved. So that we might be restored. So that we could be rescued even though we were absolutely unworthy of any of those things. God does it all for us. The gospel screams generosity. It is the most generous gift any of you will ever receive in your life. So it should come as no surprise to you and I, church, that the church that God uses will be the church that has a great heart for generosity for the gospel. Look at this church in Acts. Look at verse 45 through 47 with me. So they sold their possessions and their property and they distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. That's some radical generosity at work right there. We see the financial generosity right up there on the surface. That's real easy to see. But there's also generosity in their time. There's generosity in the sacrifices they had to make to be in these places to break bread together. You know they made sacrifices and were had to be generous with their schedules to accommodate other people's schedules just like we still do today. But at the center of it all, there's this passion for the gospel and they wanted to spread the good news of Christ and God moved and, and manifested himself in this miraculous way and they sold possessions and they brought it into the storehouse so God could use it to expand his kingdom. We have no record that this was any trouble for them or any struggle. They freely gave. They didn't give to a preacher. They didn't give to a project. They didn't give for their personal benefit. 
They didn't give so their names could be carved on a cornerstone and put on a building somewhere. Their generosity was for the glory of God and for the proclamation of the gospel. They were seeking and building God's kingdom. Many in our congregation have been extremely generous over the last 20 years for the purpose of spreading the gospel. And that generosity for the gospel has enabled us to plant over 25 churches here in Texas and the United States. It's enabled us to send hundreds of missionaries all around the world. Do you know the combined efforts of all of our ministries and our missionaries and our mission trips and our church planning movements and our church planning networks, the combined effort of that has reached well over 1 million people in 20 years with the gospel both here and abroad. We've drilled water wells across East Africa where people get to drink safe, clean, fresh water today because you've been generous with the gospel. We've helped clothe and feed the poor. We've helped bring shelter to those who are in need or abused or abandoned or trafficked. We as a church have responded to multiple major natural disasters in a sustained way that few churches ever do. Most churches show up, take their picture, stay a weekend or a week. They come back home and they're done. We as a church have not taken that approach when natural disasters happen and we arrive on the scene. We stay sometimes for up to six, eight months. I think when Katrina hit, we were there for almost a year. We had rotating teams that went for two-week shifts And we were there for almost a year helping with the recovery efforts. Long after everybody else was gone, we were still there with our partners helping people and sharing the gospel. The generosity of this church and others who have come before you have helped us build these two amazing buildings and building projects that every day, every week, I mean, we have... 20 or 30 different activities that happen here on our campus that all produce glory for God and help us spread the gospel. And it's helped us produce countless disciples. We've launched a network of house churches in three um, countries that are persecuted countries. All three find themselves in the top 30 most persecuted countries in the world. And we now have hundreds of churches in these three church networks that are living underground today, which, again, I'll speak more to next week. I could go on and on, but but I think you get the point. None of this is possible without your generosity for the gospel. And I believe that those who give here at our church give for the gospel and the glory of God. We understand the truth of Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then can they call on him if they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ, the gospel. We know not everybody is going to accept the gospel, but that doesn't keep us from sharing it. We know not everyone will respond to the gospel, but that doesn't keep us from sowing the seeds of the gospel. It is not our job to sprout the seed, it's our job to sow the seed. We let God do the rest. We know the principle behind 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Where Paul says the point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. The context of this is monetary in nature, but can I just tell you, we must be generous with the gospel. We will not reap what we do not sow. And if we do not sow the seeds of the gospel generously, we will not reap a harvest of disciples who come to know the truth of the gospel. If we are serious about the gospel, church, then we will be serious, devoted, dedicated disciples of Jesus who are generous with the gospel in all areas of our life. 
What we've seen God do over the past 20 years is a result of many who came before us who were indeed generous for the gospel. What happens in the next 20 years is up to us. But I tell you again, it all starts and ends with the gospel. This might be hard to imagine, but I really do believe, I honestly believe that our best years are still in front of us. In all that God has done, in all the ways God has moved, I think our greatest years are still in front of us, church. And the reason I believe that, the reason I know that to be true is this. We still have those two things we started with. We have a mission and a calling, and we have the gospel. And if we remain true to those two things, if we keep those things at the center of who we are and what we're doing, there's no telling what God's going to do over the next 20 years. Because it all starts and ends with the gospel. Let me encourage you to personally identify with the gospel if you haven't already. If you have, be devoted to it. Devoted to the gospel. Be unified through the gospel. And be generous for the gospel. And God is going to do amazing things through our church if we do those things. Do you believe the gospel? Have you heard the gospel? The most important question of all, have you accepted the gospel? If you have not called on the name of Jesus to be saved, I pray you would do so this hour. You cannot identify with something you have not accepted. You cannot be devoted to something you have not accepted. You cannot be unified through something that is not a part of who you are. And there is no reason. It would be absolutely ridiculous to be generous to do something you don't believe in. Towards something you don't believe in. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray you would do so today. There's no other name under heaven by which you may be can be, or ever will be saved. It's only through Jesus and his gospel that you and I have the hope of eternity. Let's pray. If that's you, I'll remind you again, it all starts and ends with the gospel. If you can hear my voice and have never accepted the Lord as your Lord and Savior, we would invite you to do so this very hour. We don't ask you to raise your hand or to come to the front. Just pray with me there where you are. Say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I have gone astray. And so I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of your grace and the good news of the gospel. I thank you for meeting me here today. I thank you for saving me this hour. I ask now that you would help me to identify with, be devoted to, be unified through and generous for the gospel for the rest of my life. Lord, as we close this day and this hour, we are grateful for who you are, for all you have done. Lord, I'm grateful that you called me to come and join a church some 20 years ago that didn't have anything. Lord, I don't even know if we had much sense looking back on it all, but we had the two things that mattered the most. A clear calling and mission from you and a very devoted sense of what the gospel was and what we were supposed to do with it. Lord, we are grateful for all that you have brought to us over the 20 years, for all that you have added to this ministry, for all the ways you have allowed us to go and do and be and share and sow. But Lord, never, ever, ever let any of that overshadow the most important thing, which is the gospel. 
Lord, my prayer for the next 20 years of this church is that we would be increasingly devoted to your kingdom and your gospel so that we can reach this lost and fallen world with the good news of Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. And Lord, thank you for letting us have a little part in your story. Father, we ask and we pray these things now in the name of Jesus. Amen.